general functional. Okay, I think we're probably good to get going five minutes in. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so we can see who's in the room. So if you'd like, I mean, I always like to encourage people to have their <clears throat> cameras on. You don't have to, but it's up to you. I think it's helpful just to know who else is here. Um, and feel free to put any, again, questions or comments in the chat. I like when people weigh in on things throughout these presentations. So even if you have a thought on a particular subject that we're going through, just feel free to put it in the chat. And again, you can either raise your hand if you have a question while we're going through or wait till the end when I'll open it up for questions. I don't think the actual presentation will take terribly long, probably 30 to 40 minutes or so, maybe quicker, maybe longer, depending on how we are. But Thanks again for joining. And as mentioned, this is being recorded today and it will be visible for later viewing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, if you have any, any ideas that come to you for other programming coming from our office throughout this presentation, feel free to send those to me afterwards as well. We are always looking for student uh, requests and recommendations. So I'm gonna dive into the presentation. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so again, today's presentation is on getting gallery shows, commissions, and residencies for visual artists. It's part of the Center for Life and Works Creative Career Conversation Series, which encompasses all types of conversations regarding professional development, showing your work, uh, feeling ready to present your work, networking, making your professional packet look ready to go, all that stuff about, you know, just preparing for life after graduation. And today, this is being led by me, so our team sometimes divides up our programming. Um, real quick, I wanted to kind of bullet point in here why I am doing this, since you probably want to know why do I feel like I have this knowledge. Um, for my career has been pretty broad throughout the visual arts, but very much only within the visual arts. And I have a, a BFA in painting from SUNY Purchase and a certificate in small business and entrepreneurship from Hunter College in New York. Um, so these are things that I do and have done that make are relevant to this particular presentation. So as mentioned, I'm currently the director of the Patty Disney Center for Life and Work. Uh, it's my day job. Uh, by night and weekends, I am a painter. Um, I really do truly spend almost all of my nights <laughs> in the studio. That's how I get things done. Um, I'm the owner of an artist-focused consult consulting agency called Studio Associate and all the other free time that I have. And as far as showcasing my work, I've exhibited with Anat Ebge in LA, TSA LA, Tamor Grania online and in London, Anna Moss Projects in Barcelona, Pierogi, a bunch of others in New York. Um, I spent my entire life on the East Coast until a year ago. So uh, that's where I've done most of my um, exhibitions. I've done a few large scale murals. I've received a Queens Council on the Arts grant, facilitated some large scale commissions. I'll talk about that. And I've done a handful of residencies. I've also run several galleries in New York. Um, some I've co-directed, some I've managed as again, paid day job. So that's kind of my overview. So I like to say that I've really existed on both sides of the art world in my entire professional career. So both as an artist and then as a arts administrator and director and manager and all that stuff. So I've really had my hands in a lot of different aspects of the art world. Uh, again, this is very much, my world is very much visual art. Um, this presentation is certainly geared towards visual artists, but a lot of these ideas can be translated to other fields um, in the creative economy. So that's kind of where I'm coming from here. So now I want to know who else is in the room. So I'm going to stop sharing again. And I would love for everyone to unmute if you're willing and just let us know your name, your uh, pronouns, and then your if you're a BFA, MFA, your year, and then your major. And then if you could also say why you're here in this current Zoom call, I would love to know why you're here. I know some of you wrote me ahead of time, 
Um, but just so we can kind of hear what everybody else is thinking at the moment, I would love to get some of that information from y'all. All right, so I'm going to start with the first person I see. And then once you're done, so again, name, pronouns, year, major, um, and then while you're here today, pass it off to somebody else. So first person on my screen is Jonathan. <clears throat> Hello. Um, yeah, Jonathan, he or they. Um, I am a second year MFA in art. And I am here to um, hear your experience and have your insights because um, I'm interested in the art world and um, yeah, I want to know and anticipate what to expect for the future and just just have a just more broader um, insight into what I might stumble into or not. But, mm. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, you want to pick the next person? Uh, I see Tom, Ryan. Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, Hello. I'm Tom. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm an MFA too in the art program. And um, yeah, I'm interested in exploring what uh, making a living in the art economy looks like post graduation. Uh, that's just one art interest I have, but it's definitely a thought. So um, that's mostly why I'm here. And uh, yeah, uh, curious to hear, especially about like uh, your experience in galleries as a painter. Awesome. All right, thanks. And you want to pick the next person? Sure. Um, I see uh, Mao. You want to go? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mao. Um, I go by she, her pronouns and I'm a BFA for dance student. And the reason I'm here is because um, I would like to know your experience about um, getting residency, mm -hmm. especially, and get prepared for post-graduation. Great. And I'll pass it to um, Sokyong. Hi, I'm Sokyong. Um, I'm from Film and Video. Uh, she they. Um, I am mostly interested in residency um, mm -hmm. because I'm graduating and I'm I found some residencies that I want to apply to so I just wanted to join this meeting. Um, I'll toss it on to Neha. Neha. Hi. Um... I'm Mina. I'm an MFA one in the art program, uh, she, her. And I'm here because, uh, I mean, I guess like everyone else, I'm curious to see how the gallery system works in LA and just, I think it's good to be prepared as a grad student. And yeah, yeah. Uh, Alungo, do you wanna go? Hi, my name is Alungo and I use she, her pronouns. I'm an exchange student, but studying in an MFA uh, program here in art in my first year. And I'm also interested in understanding how gallery representation is able to work in the future and understanding how there is perhaps ways that you could uh, magically meet the right people, which I have heard so often that I don't believe that is just magic. So I think there must be some strategy behind it where I'm interested in learning how this will work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will um, give the mic to Sophia. Oh. Sophia. Okay, maybe she can't. Okay, in transit. So. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. mm, otherwise, maybe Mahidi. Hi, my name is Mahidi. I am alumni. I just graduated uh, this year. So I'm definitely in the <laughs> same situation uh, to know what would like, like would be my future. Uh, so kind of I'm really interested in gallery or the residencies that I'm applying right now. But didn't get it uh, much in like yes yet so I want to know 
more. I wish I get, get it when I was in school, but anyhow, it's good chance for me. And I go with Chihar. Um, what was other question I forgot? But um, here I am. Your major, so you graduated. Oh, I was, yeah, I, I was in art school. Okay. Uh, I did my MFA there. So I'm passing it on to Katie. Thank you. Um, my name is Katie. I go with she, her pronouns. I'm an MFA too in the art program, and I'm interested in gallery opportunities and how to get them. Um, I don't know who Apple's iPhone is, <laughs> but I'm going to call on them. And then if they don't respond, I'm going to call on Chris. Okay, Chris, if anyone who is not on video but does want to weigh in, we have Chris and Morgan. Either one, going once. <laughs> I'll go. Um, if uh, yeah, uh, my name is Morgan uh, Ogilvy, and I graduated from the art program in 2020. And I'm interested in. I'm always trying to improve my applications for um, residencies and grants, um, and find that I always am hopefully making them better, but getting this sort of feedback is extremely helpful. And then also um, gallery representation. I'd like um, any um, anything I can learn from that as well. I'm living in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. This is where I grew up and tried to go to Los Angeles somewhat, um, somewhat regularly. So that's sort of my situation. Uh, and I'm she, she, her. Um, and I, I guess we called on, it seems like everyone. <laughs> I think so, I think so. If anyone else has not gone yet and wants to feel free to unmute. Otherwise we'll get started. Oh, look at that cutie, oh. cutie. What a cute little, little critter. <laughs> <laughs> so small, <laughs> such a tiny dog. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute. All right, I am going to dive back into the presentation. Thank you all again for being here. Okay, so I hope that I can share some wisdom with y'all today. It sounds like we're looking at some of the same uh, concerns. So what I'm hearing a lot is exhibitions. So how to get into exhibitions, residencies, how to uh, have a strong application. While this particular presentation isn't so much about the applications themselves, a lot of this will be more so geared towards what do we really wanna get out of these different opportunities as artists. Um, I will go over this at the end, but in case anyone can't make it through the end of this, there is a grant writing workshop for artists being presented this coming Sunday through Drawing Cabinet, which is an arts nonprofit in LA. And our department has sponsored a handful of tickets for students to get into that for free. It's usually $30. But if you do want to enter for this, uh, it's first come first serve and I do still have some more tickets. So feel free to email me directly and I'll get you set up for that. It's on Sunday from one to three. Okay, so some disclaimers on today's presentation. This is being recorded and will be available for later viewing. Um, if anyone really does not want anything that they say or put in the chat uh, available on this re recorded workshop, just let me know and we can edit it. Um, this is the most introductory, briefest possible advice on getting gallery shows, commissions, and residencies based on my experience. So everything takes time, as I'm sure y'all know. Uh, my adv advice in this front is really just to be persistent and consistent, but patient as well when pursuing a career as an artist. It's a long game. It's There's lots of ups and downs. Um, there's definitely tools that you can have at your disposal and, you know, feel like you feel confident about doing these things, but it can take a while. So I always just like to say that, say it to myself too. Uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. This is just a mantra that I constantly repeat. Um, the art world is small, it is competitive, but ultimately, in my mind, if you are with a network of people and people start doing well, which they will, everyone will rise up together. So it's really helpful to be collaborative with your peers and kind of try to do these things together in a lot of ways, even though art can be quite solitary in its endeavor if you're working in a studio and not collaboratively. 
And remember that you have a breadth of resources available and knowledge at your fingertips in the form of faculty, staff, and your peers at CalArts. Don't be afraid to ask for advice from them now and forever. Okay, icebreaker, I'm going to go into our polls for right now. So poll number one, I want y'all to respond to this question. Can you see the poll at the moment? Showing up for you? Okay, so would you rather never be able to go out during the day or never be able to go out at night? Okay, we've got, oh, oh wow, wow, we're adjusting a lot. <laughs> okay, we're currently never be able to go out at night would be preferred. 67% at night. Oh, wow, 33% never being able to go out in the day. Does this correspond to your work, the way that you tend to work in the studio? Or is this just life preference? <laughs> okay. Interesting. So most would rather be never able to go out at night. Okay. These are the results. Okay. And now second question. Would you rather live in a tree house or in a cave? <laughs> Woo, we're shifting again. Okay. Most tree house. Interesting. Share results. So 83% would rather be in a tree house than a cave. I'm with y'all on that. We'd rather be up high and in the daylight. Okay, we've got one more question that's a little bit more relevant to this presentation. <laughs> okay, if you had to pick one of these, which is the most important for you to achieve one year out of school? So these are the results, these are the options. Get a studio in a building with other artists, sell $5,000 of artwork on your own, exhibit your artwork at a contemporary art gallery, attend an art residency, spend at least 20 hours per week making art, open and manage a studio building. You only had to choose one, one year out of school. Interesting. Most people are going with three. Okay, now we've got another one in the mix. Okay, so let's look at the results. 31% get a studio building in a studio, get a studio in a building with other artists, exhibit your work, contemporary art gallery, and then spend 20 hours a week making work, and then attend an art residency. So a pretty looks like exhibiting is the most important here at the moment. Okay, one more question for y'all. What is the most important for you to achieve 10 years out of school? And this might change by the end of this presentation. Gallery representation, representing myself and selling $10,000 to $20,000 worth of artwork annually, not needing a day job, living in a major city, having a big studio, teaching art part-time and having to make, and having time to make my work and exhibit it. Most important 10 years out of school. Interesting, okay. This is sort of mostly what I expected. Okay, let's see the results. 38% is the highest, not needing a day job. I, yep. Gotcha on that one. Um, gallery representation is a close second. Representing yourself and selling ten dollars to $20,000 worth of artwork annually is third. And then teaching art part-time, having time to make work and exhibit it. And then living in a major city. No one put having a big studio, which is cool. I like that no one's really too focused on that because it's not really the most important thing. Hopefully, if you get other of these things happening, you'll be able to have a studio, whatever size you want. All right, cool. Thanks for playing, everybody. <laughs> now we're going to go back in and get this started. Okay, so before we start applying to anything, so not all of what we're talking about today is going to include applying, right? Some of these things you will be invited to do throughout your career. But as we're talking about applying to things, you're also thinking about how you're talking about your work in general, right? If you have to apply to something, 
you have to write an essay usually explaining your work yourself and what you want to get out of the opportunity. So what you will need going forward is art, obviously, in whatever form that is, an audience. There has to be some person to experience your work in some way, and that can be a lot of different ways. You should have some sort of goal. And then there should be ways for people to experience and see your work. So that can be digital, physical exhibitions, um, physical studio visits, ways people can experience your work is really important. And you need to have a pretty good understanding of it and all of these things, which you're doing right at CalArts. You're getting a lot of this. These tools are being developed right now. Um, and you're getting that stuff ready. So these are the, the fundamentals of what you need to be thinking about when you're going to be pitching your work or applying to things or just talking about your work with somebody at an event. Exhibitions, we're gonna start here. So what is an exhibition? A public display of work of art or items of interest held in an art gallery or museum or at a trade fair. This is literally from the dictionary. Um, exhibition comes from the Latin ex meaning out and haber meaning hold as objects in an exhibition are held out or shown to the public, which is kind of interesting. So you can really exhibit your work anywhere, but you probably don't want to exhibit it everywhere, right? Because there's not, not everywhere is the best opportunity, the best situation, the best context with the right people, et cetera. So finding the right gallery to work with. Um, and we're going to think about, you know, short-term group shows, that's one thing. There's not that many stakes involved, but if you're talking about representation, you do really want to find the right gallery to work with. So it's kind of like finding the right job or the right best friend or romantic partner. It's a lot of trial and error, testing things out, developing your own taste, uh, understanding what it is that you're looking for, and then finding the right match. So I would love if anyone could weigh in on these extremely basic questions. I ask these really basic questions because sometimes responding to something as simple as this makes it easier to, to really kind of see what you're doing from a macro lens, right? And also explain to people outside of the art world or outside of understanding your work, what it is that you're trying to do here. So what is the general purpose of exhibiting artwork in the first place? Does anyone want to answer what, what the purpose is? So like if someone's asking you to do a show, why are you doing the show? Either in the chat or you can unmute. Anyone, anyone at all? <laughs> could be sales, it could be visibility, it could be yeah. link your CV. Is someone um, This is Morgan here. Um, you could, um, I guess I'm, you're sort of cultivating your own audience and meeting the audience of the, the location and learning more about that. Um, if it's a gallery, um, you know, you talked about um, learning, um, you know, figuring out if it's a gallery, you might want to um, represent you, um, as well, of course, as developing your own uh, followers, as in followers, as in people who collect your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Kind of gaining, cultivating that audience, that realm of, you know, the circle of supporters, getting getting an opportunity to find those people. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, I would just say, um, it's Tom here, it's just uh, like showing your work in a context that um, lets it like sort of make sense for the artistic goals of your work. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know, presumably showing your work is about sort of achieving those, like getting your message out, whatever it is. Or, you know. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so on the point of context in this question here, why is context important? Do you, how do you feel about that? Like sometimes, you know, sometimes artists are wondering what is the right context and how to, how to develop that, right? Is something it takes a while, but why do you think context is important? Uh, because everywhere, every, sorry, I, I won't monopolize the 
speaking here, but I was, my take was just that like everywhere is designed, most spaces um, where you could show something are designed for a certain purpose. And, um, you know, some of them are designed to like let people think about art and some of them are designed to like sell things that may not even be art or like, uh, or just like sell, sell like visual experiences. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's. Yeah. You want to find the right match. Right? Yeah. Make sure yeah. you both have the same goals, you and the gallery, you and the venue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we had a hand up. Yeah, uh, I, I want to say I agree with what Tom just now said that the context of the space is really important, but I personally think that the context of, of whom you're exhibiting is equally important. So who are the other people, the other artists you're exhibiting with, because you can either find people you can collaborate with in the future, or you can find people who may even distort the vision that you have for your own art with what the purpose of their art is. And I think it's important to find people who uh, are following a similar goal with what they're doing probably, or at least going into a similar direction mm -hmm. rather than working with people who may have completely other aims uh, with their art. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. One of the best questions to ask a uh, gallerist if they are reaching out to you as an artist asking you to be in a show is, and if you don't know anything about them really and haven't been to their space, you could first off ask who else they are considering putting in the show. Um, and hopefully they have some links to people so you can take a look at the other artists that are considering and see if it makes any sense. You know, sometimes they'll send you a link back and be like, oh my God, my work has nothing to do with these people. And I, I don't want to be in this context. It doesn't make sense. The dialogue isn't working. Um, sometimes we'll be like, oh my gosh, some of these people are my, you know, my heroes. I would love to show with them. So definitely. Okay. Anyone else before we continue? All right. Okay. So I'm going to get into exhibitions a little bit. So who's involved in organizing exhibitions of any type. Obviously, first and foremost are the artists. There are usually curators, gallery directors and owners. There's sometimes sales associates, art handlers, the ones actually physically moving the work around and hanging it. Sometimes there's interns. Um, there's gallery supporters, of course, which are the gallery's collectors, friends or family. And then who else? Who else might be involved? Um, could be random people walking by on the street that happen to show up at the gallery opening or wandering in during open hours. Uh, there's galleries are open to the public. They're almost, you know, they're always free unless there's some weird thing, but they're pretty, they're free to go to. And they're usually open to the public during normal business hours. So anyone is welcome to go to galleries. So that's a good thing to think about. Um, as I'm sure you all know, this is the way that it's set up here in the US. And there's a lot of people involved in making shows happen. Um, it's usually much more logistics than is you know, obvious to the public, but there's also such a breadth of range of galleries, right? There's little tiny like basement galleries, there's apartment galleries, there's a gallery in somebody's closet. There's been so many DIY spaces throughout history. And then there's Pace and Hauser and Worth and Gagosian and Zwerner and these galleries that are pretty much small museums. Um, so there's a very big range of, of galleries out there. So what else is needed to operate a gallery? There were some questions that we can, we can get into down the line as well about how to start a gallery. And I put this in here as just like the very basic components that are needed to run a space. Now, again, you can do this on pretty much nothing. If you literally have space, you don't even need space. You can have a show outside, you know, you could do it wherever you want, but you basically need some kind of space. You can also have digital shows. That's obviously become much more common since COVID. You usually will need utilities of some sort and sometimes insurance to ensure that the work that is physically in the space at all times is insured in case something happens. Um, you usually need funding, but again, not always. I mean, you could be really crafty and have a show in a space that doesn't cost anything. You usually need a press release. Uh, that's ideally the text that corresponds with the show to give it some context. 
And then marketing. Marketing is always there. Even if you don't do formal marketing, such as a newsletter or an Instagram for a show, word of mouth is marketing. Um, it's all part of it. So that's there as well. Okay, so now how do I get my show into gal or my work into shows? So I have a couple different things here. I've decided to break this up into direct methods and then indirect methods. The direct methods of getting work into shows tend to be applying to open calls. So when a gallery promotes open call for a group show, open call for a solo show, et cetera, that usually means anybody can apply to it. There are usually eligibility requirements, not always, sometimes it's literally open to anybody, but some open calls will require that an artist is either authorized to work in the United States. Sometimes they do that, it depends on nonprofit status and a bunch of different things, but sometimes they will require um, things like a certain age group or that the work relates to a certain medium or genre. But anyway, a lot of times galleries will have open calls that are open to the public. And if you are applying for them, they tend to cost money, not always, but it does tend to cost between $15 and $30 to apply to a show. Um, they can sometimes be scams. So please do your research when applying to open calls if you don't already know about the venue. Do the research. There are some galleries out there, and it's, it's not even really a scam. It's just like a no, there's no credibility, there's no curatorial work being done. It's literally just a space that someone's trying to make money off of by having artists submit and pay for open call fees. They happen. There's not a ton, but it's out there. Um, they can sometimes be curated by reputable curators, though, as well. So there are occasionally really good open call opportunities, and um, some artists will apply to an open call and get a solo show in a gallery in New York. And even if it's a small space, that show could lead to something else. So there's a lot of different things that can come from open calls, but please do do the research because there's a lot of crap out there. It's not worth your time or money. Um, you could form or join an artist collective. And so these are the components of that. Sometimes, usually it costs money to join a collective like any other membership or um, professional network, there's usually some kind of cost involved to administer the whole thing. But some of the perks are that it connects you to an existing community of artists and allows you to contextualize your work if you're organizing shows through the collective. A lot of artists will do this when they first move to a new state, a new city, so that they can really easily get into an existing scene of artists. So it's an option. It's been going on forever. Um, you know, there's there's artist collectives that end up becoming really important and historical. There are some that are just tiny and, you know, they really help each other. People who are involved help each other. Um, but and it's like low commitment. Right. Um, and then getting gallery representation is the other direct method to showing work, obviously. So if and we're, we'll go into this further, if you get gallery representation, they will sell the work for you. They'll show the work for you. They'll do everything for you. Uh, things about that is it, it takes time to cultivate this. It can be prohibitive to showing elsewhere. It, again, really depends on the gallery and the contract. And it can be difficult to break up with the gallery. So a lot of artists, if they're negotiating gallery representation, they really want to spend time thinking if it, it's the right thing. Because if you enter something and it turns out to be not good, it can be hard to leave. Um, I know an artist who in the or early 2000s signed with Marvel Marlboro Gallery in New York, and they had an extremely exclusive contact contract that was seven years. So the artist was not allowed to show with anyone else or sell any work for seven years. Um, and he broke that contract and they sued him and it pretty much tanked his career. So there are things to think about. There's also a lot of pluses to representation. We'll get into that in a second. Um, other direct methods, exhibiting in unconventional spaces. So again, you can kind of do whatever you want here. You can work with friends. If, again, if you have a collective, you can do shows anywhere. Um, you could do things like show in local coffee shops and restaurants. I, obviously that is not ideal, but a lot of people do this stuff starting out. You can show work in your apartment. You can have a party and have your work up. Uh, you can have a studio, an open studio day. And these are ways to physically just get people to see what you're doing. You can show at like festivals, parties, you know, things like that. 
um, art fairs. So an art, an art gallery has to exhibit work at a, a formal art fair. We'll get into that a little bit more in a sec. Um, pros are it's presented to a global audience, of course, and the only the only thing only thing is it's really like entirely sales focused. So art fairs are really not not like exhibitions per se. Um, hopefully they will lead to exhibitions and further visibility, but they're really just about selling art. And then craft and artist run fairs. Um, sometimes usually they cost a lot of money. You gotta find the right context again. There's a lot of things out there that's not not the great not the right fit for somebody looking to eventually exhibit in a museum. Um, just really depends on the organization. And then there's a few artists run fairs that are reputable and often springboards for emerging artists. Spring Break Art Show is one. Uh, for example, they have a New York and an LA fair every year and any artist can apply to be in it. Any curator can apply. Um, I've done a few of these, so I can weigh in on that more if you want, but it's that's something to look into, I think. And then indirect methods. Uh, real quick, and then I'll address one question in the chat. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm just seeing it will be recorded, and we'll I'll share this out after the after the um, event today. Okay, indirect methods. These are really important. So take note: <laughs> having an effective, unique website and marketing strategy. I, let's forget about how ugly the word marketing or networking might be. This is literally just how do you show your work to people. Um, Marketing is all of that. So boosting visibility so that curators can find your work. That's a really important method of getting shows eventually. You wanna research your audience, your market, your field, your competitors and your allies. So really this is just being aware, um, being confident and concise when talking about your work, meeting people, going to events, forming relationships, AKA networking. I can't stress how important this is. Um, it doesn't look the same for everybody, obviously. This, this is not like go to a networking event and introduce yourself to random people. I mean, this can be going to parties again. It could be going to openings. Every art opening is free and open to the public, and um, they're usually really fun. Hopefully, you all are already doing this. Uh, it's really important to do these kinds of things just to understand what's happening out there. Again, understand the context, see who else is going to things and like what they're doing. Um, and what the gallery is, you know, trying to cultivate. Joining or forming an artist community of like-minded makers, super important as well. Again, these are very indirect ways of getting shows, but they will all lead to them. Being a good person and making wise, well-informed career decisions. That's pretty darn important, especially in a very small world like the art market. Um, you want to just make sure that you're, you know, taking care of your work and doing the right thing and making sure that it's, you know, protected and you have control over it. There's all these things that are, you know, really built into just making good decisions with your work throughout your career. You can attend residencies, especially ones that culminate in exhibitions. You also usually meet a lot of people at residencies. And then pitch exhibitions of your work with others to galleries that you have relationships with. So this is something that sometimes isn't thought about that much, but you will you will have relationships with gallery directors. Um, sometimes they'll be friends and there might be options for you to think about like, oh, I have a really good idea of a, a two or three person show, me and, and someone else. And if you put together a pretty great looking proposal and you are close enough with someone to, to pitch it to them, um, or again, to an open call, then do it. That's a really, really good way to design the context that you want to be in, you know, design who, what, other artist, what other artists that you want to work with, and then try to have a show that way. Okay, some more indirect methods, participating out in the art world in other ways, such as organizing shows of other artists, so kind of giving back to the community, writing reviews of gallery shows for a local or digital publication, um, it might seem not related, but it just really helps become involved and it helps, you know, a lot of artists also figure out how they want to talk about work. Working a day job in the art world or art adjacent roles, working a day job not in the art world, but that intersects with art world supporters and positions you in scenarios to learn more about them and to meet them. Teaching art and uh, so basically just teaching art 
where you can meet and mentor other young artists and other faculty that you'll be teaching with that might give you exhibition opportunities. That's also a big one. Is anything else on anyone's mind as an indirect method or direct method that I haven't mentioned? Can anyone think of anything else to do to kind of just position yourself into a way to, to get shows? Nothing else yet? Okay. Well, if you think of anything, put it in the chat. Hopefully I'm covering enough. And that's why that's why I have no questions. Okay, so who do who thinks what is better? Does anyone think indirect or direct methods that we just went over are better? Any thoughts? I think both are equally important, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Mix. I agree. So we want to be making sure to, to do things in both of those categories pretty consistently. Agreed. Okay. Types of exhibition venues. So it's just fun to think broadly about what, what is an exhibition venue? What are the options? What's out there? We've got contemporary art galleries. So it's current artists making current work, modern art galleries. So, you know, the modernists, um, more historical work, secondary market galleries. Um, these are galleries that are dealing entirely with uh, works that are sold at auction or belong to somebody's collection who is trying to sell it. Auction houses, museums, performing arts centers, arts nonprofits, and then unconventional spaces as we sort of went over. Um, here's a photo of Red Cat. So Red Cat's a good example of a multimedia space that has an exhibition venue in it and it's affiliated with CalArts. Um, now, I'm just asking this to the audience. What's the difference between an art gallery and a museum? I know some of you know the answer to this. So who, who's gonna answer? Oh, uh, I have a question. Uh, can you please, I mean, it's, I'm not answering the question you just asked, but can you please repeat what a secondary market gallery is? Yes. So secondary market is essentially when a collector or anyone buys a piece of artwork from a gallery or from an artist, and then they resell it. That's, that's when the work enters the secondary market, essentially. So some galleries exist out there that own the work. They actually, the dealer probably who runs the gallery owns the work themselves. It belongs to them. They bought it already and they're trying to sell it. So they'll have exhibitions of that work with the intention of selling it. It's not really about the exhibition. It's more about the sale. Okay, so one answer in the chat, nonprofit versus for-profit as far as the difference between an art gallery and a museum. That's, yeah, that's definitely a major component. Some galleries are nonprofits. Um, there are also for-profit museums, but it's very unlikely. So the majority of art galleries are for-profit. They sell artwork. That's how they make their money. And then the majority of museums are nonprofits. And the work that museums tend to have belong to the museum. They are in their permanent collection. And they are, again, on display for the sake of the public to be able to see them, but they are not selling the work usually. Sometimes museums will sell work to raise money for the museum, but that's that's the big difference here. And a lot of times it costs money to get into museum, of course. Okay, uh, my last thing on exhibitions here is instead of going along the route of what I just talked about, like all these existing venues and ways to sell work and ways to show work, you can also create your own opportunities. I'll be saying this a lot, and um, if any of you do other classes or workshops with me, I'm very much about the DIY uh, way of doing things. So I have an example here of two pieces. This is uh, two works by artist Justin Amrein. Um, he's one of my best friends personally. I've worked with him for a very long time. I've also represented his work through my company, and he does. he's the best example in my mind of someone who realizes huge, crazy projects on his own being as resourceful as humanly possible. Um, so this is a an actual house that his best friend lives in, in Sacramento. And he pitched this idea of painting his house for him to be a, a sculpture. And his friend said, sure, go for it. 
So that's what he did. He spent a few months doing this and in, in exchange helped him on like projects around the house. Uh, it got tons of news coverage and it's now like a permanent sculpture. So I think it's a pretty cool example of creating an opportunity for yourself. Uh, he also did this project in Portugal, where he, it's really a public art piece. Um, it was not permitted by the city. He just went around and painted these dock bollards in the middle of the night for several months. And it's now this big, uh, big exhibition project that he's working on that's kind of trying to span the globe. But again, he's just doing this on his own, which I think is really cool. OK, so after we've gone through all of that, I would love if anyone would want to put in the chat or say where they want to show their work. So you can be specific either by listing gallery names or venues or broad, such as listing, you know, saying I want to show in arts nonprofits. I want to show in public parks. I want to show in corporate spaces, whatever the hell. Um, if you have gallery names, like, you know, you want to show at Hauser and Worth, you know, you want to show at, um, Commonwealth and Council, anywhere else uh, can be LA, can be New York. Let us know where you want to show. Let's see if there's anywhere in common here. Either put it in the chat or tell us, tell the group. Anyone? I'm sure you have ideas. I know you all want to show in certain places. <laughs> Human resources, yes, very cool. Different museums, yes. Documenta, yep. Cool. Red Cat, yep. Matthew Brown, mm hmm. These are great. Spring Break, yep. I do like museums, of course, right? It's like, yes, we all certainly want that. I think honing in on which museums is good. It's tough because it's a long, museums are a long goal. There's a lot of building up a career and, and showing with galleries and artists can't sell directly to museums. So there's gotta be a lot of people to help you get there. But still even figuring out like regional museums is helpful. Sometimes there's really interesting local museums that have residency programs or have open calls occasionally. There's some weird things out there that aren't like, you know, it's not just saying I wanna show it to men. Um, being more strategic and intentional about those spaces is helpful. Red Cat and Spring Break, I also like to try San Francisco. So yeah, there's the like the Fog Art Fair in San Francisco is a pretty big one. Um, Frisk Museum in Nashville, very cool. Yeah, I like, again, thinking, and I know Morgan, you mentioned you're in Nashville. So thinking regionally and where, you know, where makes sense for you based on what you're doing, where you're from, um, if there's some kind of kinship that you have with the museum, I'm thinking, for example, there's in Long Island, there's a, an arboretum called the Planting Fields, and it is an arboretum. It's incredibly beautiful. It's my favorite place in the world. And they do occasionally have artists do site-specific installations. They commission them, and they commissioned Mark Dion, and I'm forgetting the other artist's name, last year to do sculptural works that relate to their work, but they also relate to nature a lot. So there's this like really nice in-between um, and these are contemporary artists that, you know, wanted to do something really interesting like that. So it's not a traditional white cube space, but it's really great. I mean, getting funding for something like that is awesome. Okay, I'm going to click through. I don't want to be too, too laborious with my, my talking. So how to know if the gallery is reputable or not, especially if you're applying for an open call with the gallery and don't already know about them. Again, do your research. Uh, ask faculty and peers if they know anything about the gallery. Go to the gallery's website and social media is anything weird. Google the gallery owner and director. Usually you can find their names in the contact page. Um, just do your research. There's, again, a lot of crazy stuff out there. I put this in here, the Nodler gallery case. Does anyone know about the Nodler gallery case? If you don't, it's fascinating. There's a really great documentary on it. Um, it was the oldest gallery in the U.S. and uh, they are now out of business after 165 years because their director was buying fake, buying and selling a lot of fake Rothko's and Pollock's and the like. And uh, they found out the person making these fake paintings was a, a man in Queens in his basement, just making fake paintings and selling them to the biggest gallery in the country. <laughs> they sold about $86 billion, I think, of, of uh, 
not real artwork. So anyway, that's a stretch. This is probably not going to happen again, but it happens on all levels. So just do your research. I don't want to scare you. I'm just, I've, I've seen a lot of crap. <laughs> okay, so gallery representation. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, so I put in here a link to, sorry, let me get this out of the way, um, a link to a artsy article that was really interesting. And just to kind of like briefly run through this, not too long ago, it was possible to collect an original painting by the Texas-based artist Mauro Martinez for under $500. He was painting small studies and selling them for $50 to $100 out of the studio. Um, and then the UK gallery signed Martinez in 2020 after spotting him um, on Instagram. We were just blown away by the work said Kennedy, gallery director. These days, his paintings sell in the 10,000 to 25,000 range and are in prestigious private and institutional collections and have a significant waiting list. The artist is currently part of Unit London's representation for Artsy's newly represented online show, which features artists who have recently gained representation with taste making galleries running from blah, 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 blah. So these are things that can happen. Um, representation can be amazing. It's what most artists want, right? Then someone does the promotion for you. They handle sales, they handle shipping, they handle storing, all this stuff. Um, so here's some of the elements of what representation entails. It's a contractual agreement between the artist and the gallery. It really should come with a literal contract. Not every gallery does it. Um, you as an artist are, you have the liberty to ask for one. I think contracts should be everywhere. So if you're asked to be represented at some point and they don't give you a contract, ask for one. Um, think of them as your agent. That's essentially what having representation is. Usually it's regional. So, and this is changing as more art galleries open in multiple cities, but generally artists can be represented by galleries in different regions, usually. Um, the gallery tends to handle sales, usually all sales. So they usually say you cannot be selling your work privately. The gallery can loan your work out to museums and exhibitions or and galleries for exhibition. They can sell your work to museums. Um, that's also like kind of rare. I mean, it happens, but there's a lot more involved with that. The gallery usually stores your work. They can sign your work from you to try to sell it with a consignment agreement during and between exhibitions. Galleries used to buy work from artists up front and then try to sell it instead of consigning it. So um, that was kind of like back in the day. It's not quite as much of a thing anymore, but secondary market galleries do this still. Um, gallery charges sales commissions. Usually that's 40 to 50% of the retail price. That's how they make their money. They insure your work. They usually arrange and pay for logistics. They handle promotion. And ultimately your gallery should be run by people you trust and whole, trust to wholeheartedly make sound decisions with your work and with your overall career growth in mind. That's what you want out of representation. Again, representation isn't like forever. A lot of artists will go through multiple, multiple galleries representing them, um, but it's important to make sure that you trust a dealer who's asking to represent you. Galleries are our businesses. As mentioned, they are for profit for the most part. That's why they take a commission. So they make money from the sales. Um, I wanted to also include the, the word curate it comes from the Latin curatus, the past participle of curare, which means to take care of. So for years, the museums and archives curators did that. They actually polished and inspected and did archival work, which is really interesting because that's not what happens anymore. There's conservatives for that. Um, but that's where it comes from. So if you're thinking of what a curator does, they take care of the art. It's a little bit more of a vision now um, than physical, but curators typically will do that for a gallery um, or for a museum. Some galleries hire curators, but a lot of times directors or owners are the ones deciding who gets to show with them and how the exhibitions are laid out. And they often write the press releases, but they sometimes hire people to do that. Some galleries are LLCs, some are S-Corps, some are nonprofits. So nonprofit galleries can apply for a lot of grants. Um, they often host benefit shows to raise money to sustain their business, but that's that's sort of the nonprofit model. There's not a ton of them out there because it's honestly just 
as you might know, pretty laborious to get nonprofit status. Um, and there's just a lot of paperwork, a lot of things you have to do and keep up with instead of just running an, a for-profit space, it's a little bit easier. Galleries have specific genres of art that they exhibit, as you probably know. There's usually a, an aesthetic that they work with. Sometimes they work with specific demographics of people and artists, such as identities or regions. Um, they are their own brand. Uh, so they're kind of like an artist themselves, to be honest. Um, and if a gallery has no continuity in their programming, they probably don't know what they're doing. So that's one of those red flags if you're researching a gallery and you're like, I don't see any connection between the shows that they put on, then they probably don't really know what they're doing. And lastly, there are unfortunate biases in the art world, just like any other field or industry. So just keep an eye out again. Um, the gallery world is quite small. So generally you will hear from word of mouth that the space is reputable or, or has a bad rep reputation. Okay, so before diving into commissions, does anyone have questions on the exhibition side of things? I know we covered a bit, um, and there's obviously a billion more things to talk about regarding exhibitions, but are there anything, are there any questions coming up now? No, going once, going twice. Okay, we'll leave time at the end too. Um, all right, so commissions real quick, and exhibitions was the lengthiest piece because that was what most people wanted to know about. So a commission, essentially, the noun it means a group of people officially charged with a particular function, which is kind of interesting to think about in the context of art. Um, it's also an amount of money, typically a set percentage of the value involved paid to an agent in a commercial transaction. So that's what we were saying before, galleries get a commission of sales. Um, but when we're talking about artists doing commissions, that's when they get paid to actually make work, right? Um, and then a verb, so to commission something, is to give an order or to authorize the production of something, such as a building piece of equipment or work of art. So there's multiple types of commissions. There are corporate commissions. So that's when a large company will pay an artist to design and implement permanent works. They're not always permanent, but a lot of times they are, or on long-term exhibition, usually in offices. There's private commissions. So that's when an individual pays an artist to design and create something for them. There are commissions for organizations and museums. Occasionally nonprofits will pay an artist to create a piece for them, either permanently or temporarily. Um, those are the standard ones. There's, there's of course more, but these are the ones that artists will come across. And who manages commissions? So the artist does, <laughs> and usually a combination of curators, gallerists, art advisors, and consultants hired by the company paying, usually project managers hired by the company paying, or designers hired by the company paying. Depends on the scale. If you do a really big project, there's probably going to be a ton of people involved in making it happen. So what needs to be managed when doing a commission? The budget, obviously, and expenditures, anything that you have to pay for to actually make it happen. Fabricators or workers that are helping to realize the project. Uh, the vision, so making sure the client is happy throughout the process, that needs to be managed. Logistics, that's shipping, insurance, all that good stuff. And then the site, so wherever the piece will end up going, that sometimes also needs to be managed. Sometimes it doesn't. It might just be somebody's wall, and it's pretty simple, but if it's something big, that will need to be managed. Um, another one by my dear friend, Justin. I wanted to put this in here because this is a cool example of a big commission. This was at Facebook headquarters in California. Um, he was commissioned to do this drawing. It's site specific and it's permanent. Um, they paid him a lot of money to be on site working around the clock for three months on making this piece. So it was a really interesting example of the artist's vision, which is really, it's his work. It's completely in the style of his work, but it was a collaboration in a way with the company because they wanted his, this machine he was drawing, it's a fictional machine, to reference the biology and the ecology of the region. So he had to do a little bit of research to figure out how that would be, but it's, a, it's an interesting collaboration. Usually commissions are like that, um, if someone's paying an artist to make something special for them, there's usually a reason, right, that they're not just buying an existing work. 
So it's a good example of something like that, especially for a big company, which we all have our, we all have our druthers about Facebook, <laughs> trust me. Um, that was also a few years ago before Meta. Anyway, logistics of commissions. So a commission contract, again, there should be a contract here, even if it's really, really basic. It should have an introduction that explains the project, defines the artist and the commissioned work and details the actual piece. There should be payment terms. Um, for commission works, usually artists are paid 50% upfront and then 50% upon completion. Uh, there should be rights defined as to who owns the work after it's done, whether it's the artist or the owner of the piece. Um, there should be an agreement about reproduction rights of the work. So if the work is photographed um, at any point in time, and uh, this is especially important when you're dealing with corporate clients or private companies that might have like uh, photo shoots in their area, right? And your work might be in the background of it or somewhere that it might be end up in the background of a film, something that makes money. There's things to think about when you're doing contracts like this, um, as well as stipulations about if the work's allowed to be exhibited or loaned. Again, this is kind of up to the artist. It's really sort of up to what you want, but it's really helpful to look at other examples of these types of contracts to see what's standard. There should be a proposal that just details what the commission work will look like so the client's not surprised. Sometimes that includes prototypes and sketches. And then a termination agreement that lays out how the agreement could be ended if you decide to go that route. This is where I got this information. Artwork Archive has a ton of really useful information for contemporary artists. One of my favorite places to look for that stuff. Here is a sample of a commission contract. Looks annoying and wordy. It's a little annoying, a little wordy, but it's not that crazy. Uh, as you probably know, in an ideal world, uh, a lawyer looks over contracts that you prepare and have somebody else sign. That's in the ideal world. I know that's not something everyone always does, but there are resources like California Lawyers for the Arts. Um, you might know someone who can just look it over and just see if it seems enforceable. Um, but these are the basics, basically. So you'll see the information up here, purchaser. Here's the piece being agreed upon to be commissioned. And then payment schedule, delivery, copyright, right of refusal, and returns. You can say no, there's no returns. Like, again, this is up to you. So you really, you get to decide. And if there's anything specific, like everyone has different mediums that they're working in, right? But some artists will work in a way with additions or um, unique, unique kind of like versions of a piece that might need to be replaced at some point or restored. Um, I'm thinking about a lot of neon artists out there who sell work to clients and have to put a clause into a commission contract saying that if the piece breaks, this is where it can be refabricated. And the artist is not responsible for paying for the remake of the piece. There's things like that you gotta think about. Okay, good or bad commissions. So the pros are you get paid to make work, that's cool. Um, you get to build relationships with the person paying for it. You're the boss, kind of. You have high visibility if it's in a public space. Um, what else? If anyone else has ideas of what might be a good thing about doing commission, feel free to weigh in. And I'll read through the cons as well. Cons, uh, they can be cumbersome. It can take a long time to actually make the piece. So it might take away from your regular studio time. Some artists hate doing that because they can't really just be in the studio making what they want to make. They like have to realize someone else's idea. Um, and then it could include a lot of back and forth with the person buying the work. I will give one specific example. Uh, I was helping to broker a commission between a very famous actor and one of our artists at this gallery I worked for. And it took like a year and a half of tweaks because the, the person buying it kept saying, can you change the color of this little piece of grass? And can you, can you put like a, you know, dark cloth over there? And they were trying to take creative control of the project and everyone was just like, this is ridiculous. So um, things like that might happen. And, and yeah, those are kind of the general pros and cons. Does anyone else have thoughts of what might be good or bad about doing a commission? And this could be, again, any scale. You can have friends asking to commission work from you. Nothing, nothing. Okay. I was gonna say you might uh, 
um, think about like who you want to be associated with if it's mm -hmm. like companies. I don't know. Yeah. That's a potential. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Not to like judge anyone for taking money from Facebook. Got to do what you got to do, but like <laughs> it's a potential con. I don't know. I might draw the line at like Exxon Mobil or something. It, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. You do, especially when you're dealing with corporations um, and individuals, right? Like Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> I mean, there's things like we have to think about when people have money. It's good to know where the money's coming from. Um, and yeah, keeping keeping your morals in in check here is pretty important. So it's a good point. Uh, Morgan, you had your hand raised. Yes. Um, also, uh, one thing that I come from a portrait or painting portrait background. And so I actually like the balance of portrait commissions with gallery work because the even though the parameters can maybe be annoying if I did that full time or that all the time, I the parameters are kind of nice when the other is so open-ended. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a good balance in that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Sometimes it is fun to to have that, you know, guaranteed and for one thing, guaranteed income, right? If you have a stable uh, process and, and business doing something like that, and also just direction and not having to labor over all of the ideas that tend to come into the studio. But if that if that's a good balance for you, that's that's pretty great. That's ideal. Cool. Thank you. All right, we're gonna keep keep trucking on here. Okay, residencies. We're getting into residencies. Um, there are so many different types of residencies out there, as y'all probably know. The, but basically the point is to give an artist time, space, community, and sometimes money, I forgot a mess here, apologies, to make art for a period of time. That's really the focus. If you think about just, just letting an artist focus on their work and not much else, that's kind of the point. Um, but there's all of these different reasons that people do residencies. So sometimes the residency pays the artist a stipend to be there. Um, sometimes they cost money to attend. So both sides of the spectrum. Some provide studio and living space. Some provide one, but not the other. Some don't provide either one. Uh, some of them invite visiting artists to give lectures to residents and to conduct studio visits. Some don't invite anyone. Some supply meals, some don't. <laughs> some are one week long. Most are one month long. And some are up to a year. Some are amongst a large cohort of creatives beyond just visual artists, and some are like really solitary. So that, as you can see, this is all over the friggin' map. There's all different types of residencies to do. I really think it's important for an individual artist to find out what they need and what would serve them best about doing a residency and go from there. Like do start the research from figuring out what it is you want to get out of doing one. So why would you want to do a residency and where would you want to go? Does anyone want to put in the chat or say out loud where they want to go? If you have an idea of a specific program or a specific country, um, I put this image here of Studio Prora because I went here a while ago. It's in Japan. Um, there was no support, but it was a life-changing experience. And I just wanted to go to rural Japan. Um, changed my work for the rest of my career. Uh, so there's all of these different reasons to do these things. But where does where does anyone in this group want to go? Any thoughts? Even like just a city or state, country? I personally really want to do one in Lisbon, Portugal. I want to go to France. France. Awesome. Go to New York. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I spent 10 years in New York. I think everyone should go <laughs> at some point. Um, Skowhegan, absolutely. Maybe back to Korea. Cool. Okay. That's always really fun to try to look back at to uh, the wherever you grew up and see if there are opportunities there. Again, thinking unconventionally. Um, this particular residency I went to in Japan was literally just a family that had a couple buildings and they opened up on applications for international artists to be there. That's all it was. It was so incredibly low stakes for them. Um, I had to pay for it, but it was very cheap to be there. So again, there's all different things that you can get out of doing a residency. 
I just did a real quick and dirty list of some reputable reputable ones out there, Skowhegan in Maine. Um, it's very expensive. Most artists don't pay the full price, but um, it's one of the most reputable ones out there. And it lives somewhere between residency and like post-grad uh, art school kind of. Vermont Studio Center in Vermont. Uh, a lot of artists end up doing this. It's like sort of a rite of passage in a weird way. Um, and that's in Vermont, it's really beautiful. You get a studio space, uh, you get all your meals paid for, and there's usually some really great visiting artists. It is expensive, but again, it's another one that most artists don't pay the full amount. You can apply to fellowships. You usually get a partial scholarship no matter what. So there's that, McDowell in New Hampshire. Uh, it's free and you get stipends and you get free meals. It's a really, really, really good one. Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts. It's seven months long and it's free and you get a stipend. Kohler Art Center is a foundry and pottery residency. It's three months long. You get a free, you get a free space and a stipend, from what I remember, a pretty good stipend and transportation costs. Sharp Wolenta's studio program in New York. This is if you want to go to New York, this is super competitive, but this is an amazing studio program in New York. You get a free private space in Brooklyn for a year. And then Bemis is another good one. It's three months, includes a stipend, includes sound and art and experimental music. This makes sense for a lot of Cal Art students, in my opinion, because it's very multidisciplinary and experimental. I think Bemis, Bemis is in Nebraska. I could be wrong there, but it's definitely in the middle of the country. Okay, some lesser known residencies. Ali Yousefi Project is in Sacramento. Um, three months, you get a free studio and living space and a monthly stipend and a concluding exhibition. It's a great deal. It's a very new program. It's only been around a few years. So not that many people know about it. Uh, the one I went to, as I mentioned, this is really just a specific thing. Like, again, if you wanna go to some specific place, look up residencies there and see what they have. Plum Line Residency in New York. Again, a really, really good one to apply for. You get free studio space in Brooklyn. It's curated or it's juried by various gallerists in New York. So uh, Bridget Mulholland is the director of Anton Kern. She did a recent jury. So you could apply to a residency being juried by a gallerist. So your work gets in front of a gallerist while you're applying these things. It's a good opportunity. Acadia National Park in Maine. It's a weird one. Um, free housing for two weeks in exchange for public programming. And then Rabbit Island is another weird one. I tried to scan the, you know, the whole radar here. It's, you know, this is a remote off the grid residency in an island in extremely rustic conditions. It's very selective. I think it's super interesting that things like this exist. So it's just good to know. And then the Arctic Circle residency is another interesting one. Three weeks on a ship sailing around the Arctic. It's expensive, but it's probably a life-changing experience. So all the things that artists get to do, it's so cool. Um, okay, this is a very brief overview of the Ali Yousefi project. Um, again, Justin Amrine is the one I know who did this program, had like the absolute best things to say about it. And this was um, him working in his living space. So you get this giant loft for free in addition to a giant studio in a building with other artists. Um, Shirley Tay is at the, oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I've heard of a lot of artists that do that one and it seems really, really help, uh, reputable and extremely rewarding. Um, this is just an image from that same uh, same artist, same residency at Ali Yousefi. This is their exhibition space. It's freaking beautiful. Um, so pretty cool opportunities out there. Where to find them? This. I'm going to navigate to resartees.org. Has anyone used this already? Okay, let's see if we can get in here. So, okay, cool. So some people have used it. This is really, I think, where to where to go. Um, so if you want to look at residencies, you can go to residency profiles or open calls. And so can you get? Let me get to the actual residencies. Let's see, opportunities. Let's see, what was on here before? Um, you can narrow it down by things like location, whether it's paid or unpaid. Let's see if we go to Europe, what we get to. Uh, my internet's a little slow, I apologize. 
Hmm. I don't know why this isn't loading, but anyway, you can, okay, you can narrow it down by location and then look at all these different filters here. So you can do discipline, you can do practical facilities, duration of residencies, um, organization type, accommodation type. There are really important things you got to think about, um, especially with accommodations or with things like if you have a family and you need to, you know, bring them to wherever you go. There are residencies out there that are open to families being there. So there's a lot of different options, but this is really where to look, in my opinion. Super helpful. Okay. Okay. That's actually the end of my presentation. So I'm going to open it up to a Q&A um, or conversation, whatever y'all want. And I will just leave it here on our upcoming opportunities page so you know what our office is doing. Um, this is where we're at right now, obviously. Uh, my colleague Lonnie is, is leading a uh, info session with Support Black Theater on October 27th, that will be online. Slice of Knowledge, so our Life and Work Advisor, Sarah Melnick, will be offering resume and cover letter review open to any student. This will be on campus. Um, and then the Grant Writing for Artists Workshop. Again, this is Sunday, I want to say I have 10 entries left. So this would be super helpful if you're interested in applying for stuff. If you are free on Sunday, um, just write to me and ask for a code and I will let you know. And then we're doing a, an info session with Red Cat. It sounds like that'll also be interesting to everyone in this room. That will be with Zhao Ribas, who is the executive director and Edgar, who is, I believe he is another executive director. I, I might be getting his title wrong. Um, at Red Cat about how the entire operation works, um, how they curate shows, who gets to have shows there, what the conversation is between the exhibitions and the screenings and the performances. So that should be really, really fun. All right, so I'm gonna stop talking and open it up for questions or conversations. Anyone have any questions or thoughts on this presentation? Any any ideas of what they're going to do next with this info? Um, could we contact you for the imp workshop? Let me put in my email address in the chat. So basically anyone who wants to get a, a voucher for the workshop, just send me an email. I'm collecting all of the emails that way, and then we'll send out the vouchers. Any questions, questions, comments, things you want to see from our office going forward? Going once, <laughs> going twice. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Morgan's asking, what is the best way to reach out to artists and people in the art community at shows? That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of different ways to reach out to people that you don't already have a relationship with. There is the option of just emailing them. Hopefully they have an email address listed online somewhere. Um, I think being really strategic about what the intention is of reaching out to somebody is key. So if you if you just like their work and want to talk to them about their work, want to go to a studio visit, you could email somebody and ask them like, hey, I really like your work. I would love to come to your studio if they're local, obviously. Um, are you open to studio visits? Something like that. If it's something like I mean, that's kind of the easiest way to get a conversation started, even if it's not super, there's not like a specific thing you want to get out of this. You just want to know, get to know them. That's a really good way to start. If you don't have their email, I mean, the majority of artists use Instagram as con as commonly as they use email now. Um, so if you can find them on Instagram, you could always message them that way. I do generally think if a, if, if a request is... Um, framed first as appreciation. So if you appreciate their work and tell them that up front and then ask them whatever it is that you are asking, um, that's a good way to start. But most of the time artists, you know, we want to hear that people care and are paying attention. So getting a message from someone, even if it's random and you don't know them, that says, I love your work. That's always a good way to start. So I think it's the intention and then how you frame the ask. Uh, email is good. Instagram is good. If you have a mutual friend and they will be willing to put you in touch, that's mm -hmm. really good. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Are there any other like intricacies of that that aren't quite specified? 
Okay, great. Okay, where do you find? Oh, good question. So where to find gallery shows? Um, the Seesaw app, I think is the best thing to do. I don't have my phone with me, um, but it's a it's an app. Let me get out a screen share and find it for y'all. I think it's the most kind of co uh, biggest grouping of current shows. Galleries have to pay to be on this. Um, so not every single show is on it but it is regional and this is what I use to find things. Um, for your art, curate.la, yep. Um, those are some good ones. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. If you're just, yeah, if you're just trying to find like what has events to go to in general in LA, using one of those links is pretty good. Uh, generally, you'll also want to figure out which galleries you really care about and whose programming you really like, and then just get on their mailing list and make sure that you get an email every time they have a new opening and be at them as much as you possibly can, because it's really important to show that you support what they do. Um, cold calls is something you know that's talked about a lot. I probably should have put a little bit in here about this, but you will get different advice on cold calling people, right? I'm sure you've already experienced that. Some people will say, don't ever show your work to some random person. Don't come up to a gallerist at their own opening asking to show, to like look at your work, which I agree with, like don't bombard people. But I do think a carefully crafted and intentional and logical sort of inquiry through either email or Instagram is, is okay. And they can result in actual relationships. Um, so cold calling isn't quite as like scary as it seems. You used to curate LA before I moved. Oh, cool. Thank you for the recommendations. Awesome. Yeah, it's regional too, right? Like Seesaw is big in New York as well. Um, but every, every place will have a different kind of directory to go to to find shows. Any other questions? Okay, I'm thinking the common thread. Okay, let's see. We have a question for Tom. Advice for meeting gallerists short of begging them to look at your work. Um, yes, I think, honestly, the way I try to think about it is, is like any relationship building exercise, but it is professional, of course. Um, this is our careers that we're, we're talking about. We want to be intentional and um, considerate and all that stuff. But I do think one of the best things to do is literally to just go to their shows, to go to their openings as much as you possibly can if they're local and show your face, show the support, um, engage with them on the internet. So they're probably on Instagram, engaging with them that way. And that could be liking their posts, commenting on their posts, making thoughtful comments, you know, mentioning something about the show that you saw or that you noticed. Just showing them that you're paying attention is key. And um, you could also DM gallerists if you want. If you want to go do a deep dive into a gallery's directors and their staff members, you can. The internet allows that kind of stalking. So you can try to find their directors on Instagram too. Maybe you have friends in common. Um, and maybe that can be the touch point and that can lead to an actual connection. Um, again, asking other artists who show with them to help you make that introduction is really, really important. So as you go through your career and that goes with your faculty, they're all showing, right? Um, talking to them about directors, sometimes they'll be open and realize like, oh, that makes sense. That actually really makes sense for you to work with this gallery I'm working with. Let me introduce you or come to the next opening with me and maybe we'll get a chance to talk to the director. Uh, there's things like that that can happen, which, um, it's, you know, it's really kind of artists to do that and artists should be doing that where it makes sense. Um, but yeah, as far as like begging them to look at your work, it's tough. I think Instagram makes it easier now because they can go to your page and look at it. You don't, it doesn't require you sending them anything. They can just get there, but then you can also start the conversation through DMs possibly. They can see that if you have mutual people in common, that's like one way to pretty clearly for a gallerist to see if an artist is already existing in their network in some way. 
Um, I talk about Instagram a lot and I apologize, but that's, that's really the place that a lot of real connections do happen for visual artists these days. It's specifically most more so for visual artists instead of you know, every, every medium has a different platform that's best for it. Right. But Instagram is certainly really good for artists these days. Um, and artists sell their work privately on Instagram all the time. That's another way to, to actually make money. Uh, we have a hand up, Alunga. Yeah, can I ask you something about the business that you mentioned in the beginning that it's like an art advisory kind of business? I heard about something similar in Germany, which is called Art Butler. And I was wondering, I mean, obviously you stand behind it as it's uh, the business that you founded, but mm -hmm. just as a general understanding, what can those businesses do for artists? And at what point in a career does it maybe make sense to look into these um, businesses? Mm. That's a good question. So art advisories and agencies and consultants, all that kind of bracket of people doing that type of work, it ranges a lot. Like some, my company, for example, is very, very low commitment for the artists. I represent 20 artists and I just help them sell their work privately. So if I have a client interested in their work, they, they will go through me. Um, or if the artists they have a client that they want to sell their work to, but they would rather a third party broker the deal so that I do things like ship the work, I collect taxes and like deal with that stuff and they don't have to deal with it. That's kind of what my role is as an agency. Um, but then there are other companies that do that as well. Like Art Fair, for example, is one that's online and artists can sign up to be on there. They can promote their work on there but the artist actually does the facilitating of the sales. The, the company, I'll put this in the chat, just simply has a place, digital, a digital place for the work to be promoted. Um, I don't think I know about Art Butler. I'm curious about their model because there's so many different types. There's also agencies out there that have artists like rent their work to hotels, for example, or the film and TV industry. Um, and the company will take a portion of the sale. When is it helpful? It really, I think it's helpful to be part of those things starting out if you do have work that's that you'd be willing to just sell and aren't as focused, not as focused, but like have work that you're willing to sell through a platform online just for money, um, but then also to do a little bit of promotion as well. Like it could lead to shows, right? If anyone could go to Art Fair and, and browse their artists and they might be looking for artists that way. But it really depends on what else you're, you're dealing with as an artist uh, at that time. If it's cumbersome, like I've, I've, I can't even, even count how many companies I've consigned my work to that were online sales things like this and they say they're going to promote your work and sell it and rent it blah blah and like nothing has ever come of it if it's low stakes for you it's kind of like why not but again context is important if it's a company that you look at and you're like oh god this work is terrible that they're showing then you probably don't want to be involved yeah i think art butler specific is more of an administrative um agency that helps you with things like writing up contracts for when you're mm -hmm. selling or um, helping you with finding companies that you can ship works with and I don't know there's just a lot as an artist that you have to handle and often I'm wondering how do we do this I mean we're trying to be like our own finance person our own marketing person mm -hmm. our own designer and basically everything in one person and I'm just trying to see if there isn't any scaffolds that we could use yeah okay that's interesting that that's what they focus on doing i wonder how their what their pricing model is maybe they just take a i don't know it's like everyone oh i see okay it's monthly so you could do monthly rates 19 pounds per month uh works management intuitive interface design online showrooms runs on devices so it's software it's technology to help manage these things and then Art Butler Pro, that's an expensive one, $9.50 one time or $58 a month. So that's where you get to, it looks like they manage your invoices, they manage offers. Mm -hmm. It's true. I mean, offer, artists these days are 
kind of required to do literally everything, right? Until you get representation, you have to be your own marketing manager. You have to be your own communications person, the accounting, mm -hmm. all this stuff. It's like, it's a lot. Um, it is a lot. It's hard. And I wonder, you know, for certain things like this, again, if it's, if it seems worth it, like if enough comes of it to take the load off of you, then it might be worth doing. But if I think for a lot of artists, it takes getting to a point where you're like, okay, I really can't be managing this stuff. It's too cumbersome. It's taking too much time out of my studio practice. Um, I can't manage the, the studio, my day job and all the admin stuff. Hmm. But you can also hire someone to do it in a more personal way. That's another option. Right. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any other questions? Um, I have one more if, if nobody else does, but if somebody else wants to go, I, please um, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> um, okay. I, uh, I was just curious, like, I don't, do you worry at all about like showing in a space that's like too commercial or like, like I have this opportunity to maybe show in this, I know somebody that works for like a chair company and they have this like show house kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, oh, we're looking for artists. Like, would you be interested? And I'm sort of like, it sounds like dreadfully bougie and like horrific in some ways, but it, but like maybe like a bunch of gazillionaires go through there and like buy your work, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, I'm just curious like how you think about that. And like, do, do you feel like it's a risk to like, kind of pigeon your hole yourself into like two kind of commercial uh, a, a vibe or... I think it comes down to that context question right is like if it and there again I, I'll start with saying a lot of times artists will do a lot of shows that are you know kind of like ah it happened and you know nothing necessarily came out of it but it also wasn't a detriment there was no bad things that happened your work wasn't damaged or stolen um, granted that can happen anywhere, but I think a lot of times thinking about those pieces is important and making sure the context does make sense. If it's, if it's a company that you believe in, um, even if it's, you know, designy or like somehow a little bit more consumer based than a typical fine art context, I think it really depends on like how much you trust them and how it feels like that context would be okay. You could also do stuff like that and then choose not to promote it too much. If you don't really want to like show a case to it, to the, to your audience that you're doing a certain kind of show, you can also just like choose not to do that. But I think in, uh, for a lot of artists in the beginning, we all do things that are like a little bit weird and you never know things might come from something like that as you said there could be there could be a design showroom where you know millionaires are the only ones shopping there for their couches for example um same with like restaurants you know that's another tough one does anyone really want to have their work in a cafe or a restaurant it's like I mean maybe no but also maybe yeah maybe your friends with the chef were like they have an awesome thing they're doing and you would like to support them and it seems like a good match there's also a lot of galleries out there that work in this sphere that's very much blended between art and design right and it's a little bit like not a typical fine art gallery white box as we might think about it but um but they do still operate in a way that sort of makes sense for some artists to show it really, it really depends. It's so it's, it's such a hard thing to answer. You know, I'm thinking of, I did a show at Newark Liberty Airport years ago, which on a resume looks awesome. Granted, it was in a lounge that literally no one saw. I mean, nothing happened from <laughs> the show that I did, but I was like, oh, well, you know, it's a line on my CV and it was pretty low commitment for me as an artist. I didn't have to drive the work there. I didn't have to pay for shipping. It's like, that's also really important. You don't want to be shipping, paying to ship your work all over the place if like some of these opportunities are maybe not going to be that fruitful. I think putting time and energy into the more rewarding ones is is good over the long term. But all that to say, it really, really depends. And um, I think we all we all do some shows that are like a little bit not ideal, but it's not harmful at the same time. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, I've had friends that have asked like, oh, I was approached by this person about doing a show in a weed dispensary. And it's like, well, do you care about weed? Like, does that, is that, <laughs> are you interested in that? Is it something you'd want to do? Is the space cool? Like, who is it? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, for that artist, he was like, no, I don't want to be in this context, but <laughs> um, okay. I have a question in the chat from Pia. Curious about pricing work from studio versus gallery. That's a, I knew someone was going to ask that. Um, I think that is a, a topic for another day because there it, that could be like an age, you know, year long conversation. Um, there are some really good resources again on Artwork Archive about pricing your work. And I do think our office is planning on some kind of conversation about that across all Netiers because it's a really hard conversation, right? How do you how do you figure out what your work is worth? Ultimately, it's supply and demand like any other market, unfortunately, that's just the, the truth. Um, but it's also a service-based thing. So what we do isn't always producing just products. It's also, you know, our brand, it's our entire livelihood of being an artist. It's all encompassed into producing things that uh, we are willing to sell. And figuring out what that's worth is, is a long game. And it's, if you're the one doing the pricing, so if you don't have a gallery doing the pricing, they, they're usually, they do that for you. You can just do your market research. I would suggest finding out what work costs by other artists in your similar kind of bracket, right? So other artists showing in the same sort of spaces, doing similar-ish work, maybe that have similar exhibition histories and education even to you, seeing what they're doing um, as far as pricing. But again, it's it's so subjective. You know, an artist who makes a hundred paintings per year is probably not going to price the work at the same rate, even for the same size as an artist making two paintings per year. You know, it's it's got to be really specific to the output, um, to the cost of materials, to your time. Even you know, if an artist really doesn't have that much time, and you can only create so many paintings, but you have a let's say you have a number in mind for what you want to make during a year. Um, of course, these are like these are ultimate goals, but that can be a good way to sort of figure out what you want to price them at as well. Um, studio versus gallery, I didn't address that part. So that's a good question because, so galleries take 50%, right? So a lot of times artists will think, well, if I'm selling the work for my studio, I will sell it to, to this person for 50% less than the gallery. But no, <laughs> that is not correct because you as the artist are doing all of the things that the gallery does for you. And that's why they're taking the commission. You're doing the marketing, you're doing the communications, you're doing the sales, actual stuff, you're doing the logistics. So in my opinion, if you're selling work from the studio and you have a price that you've set with a gallery from some, some show at some point in time, then take 30-ish percent off to sell from the studio. That's my opinion. Um, again, depends on the person. If they're a really good friend, you might want to give them a better deal. If you don't know them at all, um, you might want to give them like 20% off. Uh, but again, the retail price is what you always want to think about. Don't think about your net price. Retail is the public visible price. Um, that's what you want to set in stone and then adjust your commissions from there. Okay, again, I, I think we'll we'll probably get further into that in another another talk. Thanks. Thanks for you for that question. That's a good one. Any other questions? Thank you all for staying on. I know it's it's getting late. Oh, I really appreciate it. All right. Well, if there's no other questions for now, you know where to find me. Um, we are always open to advising appointments for students. Um our life and work advisor meets with any students and alum. I I don't typically do one-on-ones, but I do work with MFAs specifically in art since that's kind of the closest um, to my actual experience. So I'd be happy to meet with anyone to talk further about any of this stuff. Um, again, we have a few events coming up, so keep an eye out and hopefully you're all subscribed to our Career Corner newsletter. If not, there's ways to subscribe through the hub and through the main Cal Arts page. And yeah, reach out to me if you want to be entered for this grant writing workshop on Sunday. I really appreciate your time, everyone. Thank you again. And I hope to see you around campus. Thank you. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Sarah.
Thanks.